Hi there. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Amy Budd. I'm a creative modern at Oxford, and um, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's event, History is What Hurts the Politics of the Ability and Jesse Darling's work by Dr. Julia Smith. And this is on the occasion of Jesse Darling's uh, exhibition, No Medals, No Ribbons, which is upstairs in our galleries. No Medals, No Ribbons is the largest presentation of Jesse Darling's work to date, and it assembles artworks made over the last 10 years in to highlight how Darling explores how systems of power, such as government, religion, ideology, empire, and technology, can be as fragile and contingent as mortal bodies. The exhibition has been curated by myself and Jesse, and is conceived as a symbolic landscape of recurring gestures and motifs, ranging from aeroplanes in her presentation, which evoke counter histories and ideas of instability and dysfunction. So Julia will examine the political and ecological implications of Jesse's distinctive uh, aesthetic of debility. And I'm very indebted to Julia's previous writing on Jesse's practice, specifically the essay, Chronic Illnesses Critique, Crip Aesthetics Across the Atlantic, which was published in the Journal of the Association for Art History last April in 2021, which um, having trying to find a very uh, deep reading of Jesse's work is sometimes challenging, that really gets to grip with a close reading of the artworks. So I really found um, Julia's writing to be very generative and instructive for building a narrative around the exhibition, which was really trying to survey these artworks collectively and track the trajectory of this practice for the first time. Um, so I'm very delighted Julia is here this evening. So Julia will talk for around 40 minutes, after which there'll be a moment for some questions. This event is being recorded, which is why I'm using the microphone, because it's really not a room big enough to need a microphone. Um, but this allows us to kind of record the speech. And so if you have any questions at the end, there'll be a microphone to also um, use. Um, please also note that the galleries upstairs are now closed. Um, but if you haven't seen the exhibition, please do come back. Um, we're open until the 1st of May. So now to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Julia Smith is Lieberhulm, Early Career Research Fellow at the Ruskin School of Art and Worcester College at the University of Oxford. Previously, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Paul Mellon Centre for British Art and the Getty Research Institute, having received her PhD from the History of Art Department at UCL in 2016. Uh, Smith specialises in modern and contemporary art, with an emphasis on the legacies of empire in Britain and across the Atlantic world. Her research focuses in part on the eco-aesthetic and eco-poetic traditions of the transnational Caribbean in relation to Eurocentric and especially British conceptions of nature, landscape and ecology. Uh, thank you and I'm pleased to welcome Julia. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thank you all for coming and um, Oh, Amy, I, I can't see. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to start actually by thanking Amy um, and Jess for um, uh, giving me this opportunity, inviting me to give this talk. And um, I'm just really thrilled to have the opportunity to address so much of um, Jess's work in one place. And for that place to be Oxford, um, where, um, as um, Amy said, I'm based as a scholar at the Ruskin School of Art, um, which incidentally also means that some of my students might um, be able to come and listen to this in person, um, which is a great um, added bonus for me. So, um, yeah, as Amy mentioned, this is an expansion of an essay um, that I published um, last year, um, which really focuses um, on this idea of crip aesthetics. And so it, it focuses largely on um, the way in which signifiers of illness, um, injury, um, and what I call debility, um, so a kind of constant uh, state, a state of chronic illness um, uh, in a kind of expanded sense rather than disability specifically. Um, I um, focus on how um, the symbolism uh, and conceptual narratives around um, these um, notions of injury and, and sickness um, created a kind of um, political narrative across Jesse's um, work. And I was particularly interested in kind of removing um, uh, this symbolism from um, more autobiographical readings, which are very common in relation to Jesse's work, but also in general in our history. Um, and beyond uh, illness is very often seen as a kind of um, 
mark of exceptionality. So we're very hung up on a kind of tragic reading of illness as something that makes an individual exceptional and historically has been very tied up with notions of uh, a kind of romantic vision of the artist as someone who is um, physically and mentally tortured. Um, and so there has been this um, quite pernicious association between illness and creativity, which has inflected much of how um, um, our historians um, and publics, uh, museum goers, kind of look at um, illness within um, modern um, artwork. So I really wanted to move away from that narrative and think more in relation to current writing and thinking uh, from disability activism and disabil um, disability theory, but also in a much more vast uh, panorama of philosophers um, and artists who are really thinking more about sickness and chronic illness as a kind of way of um, thinking about the limitations of uh, the world we exist in, um, you know, whether you want to call it um, colonialism, uh, capitalism, um, uh, the reality that shapes our everyday existences, pretty much. Um, and of course, all of this has become ever more relevant in the aftermath of uh, a pandemic in which many more people who uh, wouldn't have otherwise connected with these discourses have perhaps come to realize what um, chronic fatigue, chronic illness uh, might mean in terms of um, taking a position uh, that is outside or critical of um, normative routines that we um, are sort of expected to perform, uh, whether in our workplaces or as artists uh, or as family members, as parents, um, as subjects in the world, pretty much. Um, so um, my interest was really in the idea of the ability as a kind of analytic, uh, not simply as a symptom, but rather as a kind of way of looking um, and rethinking the way we live uh, as a conceptual philosophical framework, as a form of critique. Um, and in that, I'm certainly not, um, um, I kind of, it certainly wasn't my idea, but rather I'm very indebted to the work of authors, some of which I will mention today, like Robert Mercure, um, Judy Butler, uh, Jasbir Poir, uh, and so forth, but which might not be interesting or relevant to you, but I feel like I want to acknowledge uh, my sources and my inferences nonetheless. Um, and so um, this is an expansion of that material in which I'm going to try to look at uh, a number of additional narratives that are woven into uh, this aesthetic of the ability. Um, and so I want to start with um, these two um, works um, called Sphinxes at the Gate, um, subtitled respectively um, Wounded Sentry and Pet Sentry. So those of you who've already visited the show um, already know uh, or uh, you can gather from these images that the pair is designed to be displayed inside matching perspex boxes um, which are supposed to be positioned at waist level on white plywood plinths. Um, and this is done in reference to countless institutional buildings, including, for example, the British Museum or the National Gallery in London, whose entrance is guarded by uh, two stone lions. And <coughs> so we have an example here. And so, as you can see, um, Jesse's work, Jesse's lions, uh, sentries are very, very different from these um, precedents which typically hark back to uh, the Enlightenment period, um, so the inception of the modern age. Um, and um, so to go back to them, um, darling sphinxes are, I would say, display an emphatic lack of monumentality. Um, their anatomies are barely outlined by a skeleton of unpolished steel rods. Fur, flesh, muscle, and tendons are just left to the imagination. And instead of thick manes, the two felines um, sport an aura of white expanded polystyrene blocks. And so the only cast elements are the muzzles, and in the case of wounded sentry, the left paw, which resembles little more than a stump wrapped in medical bandages. This emphasis on injury, uh, or what I call more broadly de debility, points to a more profound rejection of the heroism projected by the architecture of modern museums, as well as a disavowal, and that's kind of core to my whole take on Jesse's work, of the sovereign subject conjured by these edifices. Um, as we know, ad nauseum, male, regal, self-possessed, um, essentially the kind of core subjecthood um, that is at the um, very basis of 
what we understand as modernity um, in the West. So um, to me, um, Darling's sculptures speak instead this, the language of demasculation in keeping with the artist's stated ambition to achieve, in their words, a non-macho sculpture practice. Um, so we already see in these examples woven together uh, what might be um, understood on, on one level as a queer um, critique of uh, masculinity, uh, uh, a critique of patriarchy and histories of patriarchy, but also on a much more profound level, an engagement with how um, these um, concepts and social formations have shaped uh, our reality from the buildings and the squares we uh, travel through to um, the political fabric of our existence. Um, and it's worth noting that these uh, two sculptures, Wounded Century and Pet Century, were originally created in 2018 to frame the neoclassical entrance of the room allotted to Darling for their Tate Britain show, um, where these sculptures mobilized a site-specific critique of the national collection, um, Tate Britain, as an institution designed to house and glorify modern conceptions of political sovereignty and cultural enlightenment. So the exhibition uh, at Tate Britain was titled The Ballad of St. Jerome. I'm gonna spend a little of bit of time with it because it was um, originally in the context of this exhibition that I started writing about um, Jesse's work. Um, and so the title, The Ballad of St. Jerome, uh, suggests from the outset that the show basically hinged on a kind of rewriting, a critical um, reinterpretation of the Christian legend of St. Jerome and the Lion. Um, and according to this parable, um, which I should probably mention, um, provided the iconography for countless paintings, particularly in the early modern period, the Christian scholar was studying in the library of a secluded monastery when a lion suddenly appeared out of nowhere. And recognizing that the animal was in pain and injured, Jerome proceeded to extract a thorn from its paw following which the now tame beast turned um, allegedly into its most faithful companion, which is what is generally celebrated in these paintings. Um, so for Darling, uh, the moral of the story um, was two-sided in the sense that if initially they'd been drawn to this narrative um, because it suggested the possibility of interspecies kinship, of this beautiful friendship or love story between um, an animal and a man between two, two different species. Um, and this idea, I think Jesse talked about in terms of um, syndrome, recognizing the sort of the wound, the fragility in, in the other and taking it in and embracing it. And this being this beautiful sort of allegory for a, 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 pos the, a kind of political possibility. At the same time, the more they um, sat with this story, the more they started to rethink it through the viewpoint of the lion and sort of came to the conclusion that um, on the other hand, the parable also establishes, re-entrenches the dominance of man over the wild and the wounded in that the lion had to sacrifice something fundamental to its nature in order to be taken in by Jerome. Um, and it's telling in this respect that wounded sentry is gagged with a dog bowl. So strapped on like a muzzle, the implement resembles bondage gear, with bondage describing both a sexual practice and a state of enslavement. The implications of this symbolism to me are clear, even though they are multi-layered. So the lion takes on the submissive role, while Saint Jerome becomes the dominant lover in a homoerotic romance that transgresses the boundaries of species differentiation. Um, Audrey Lord once qualified the practice of SNM as, quote, a depressing replay of the old and destructive dominant subordinate mode of human relating and one sided power, which is even now grinding our earth and our human consciousness into dust, which is perhaps a harsh and unfair um, take. Uh, on, on this uh, form of relationship, but at the same time, I think it points to how the dynamic, even in Jesse's work, is sort of pointing to much broader, more abstract power relations. Um, and the idea at its core of what it means to um, perform a form of violence uh, upon another subject, particularly a subject that is othered, however you might interpret that. Um, and so, to me, in a similar way to Order Lord's point, the Ballad of St. Jerome mobilized a profound critique of history. Um, 
And one, you know, from one level, you could interpret Darling's um, take on the legend of Saint Jerome and the Lion as a kind of critical commentary on um, the doctor-patient relation, uh, aligning it with a history of feminist and queer critiques of the paternalism of the medical sector. Uh, more profoundly, the exhibition for me invited reflections on the Faustian nature of the modern social contract as an institution that historically has served the double function of protecting and at the same time policing its constituent subjects by offering vital benefits in the way that Jerome does by healing the lion and taking him in, in exchange with, for compliance uh, with the protocols of heteronormative capitalism. So there is this sort of massive trade-off, which is ultimately what becomes interesting about this Christian legend uh, to Darling. Um, at least that's how, uh, you know, in my, in my reading of the work. Um, and I, th I should say that this take on the parable is uh, especially original, um, not just because of its um, queer connotations, but also because St. Jerome has traditionally been seen as a real beacon of humanist values, um, which also explains his pro prominence as a pictorial subject during the Renaissance. This image of Jerome in the study with the lion has just always been um, uh, a kind of idyllic ideal of what the modern scholar, what the modern subject should be all about. You know, the books, the, the relationship with the natural world, the mysticism, um, kind of all in this sort of perfectly harmonious, beautiful um, study setting that just kind of feels really cozy and wonderful, that that's very much the aesthetic of these early modern paintings. Um, and so, very much in contrast against received convention, in 2018, Darling chose to portray St. Jerome uh, with a selection of authoritarian and at the same time sexually degrading props. So here, you're looking at, um, on the left, regalia and insignia, the staff of St. Jerome, that's the title of the assemblage, um, in which two 3D printed hands strung together with electrical wires uphold a baton made out of a rubber pole crowned by the tip of an upside down toilet brush. Um, so St. Jerome becomes this sort of um, <clears throat> kind of scatological monarch. Um, and so for me, um, and I hope I'm not straying too much here, um, this work performs something comparable to the operation, intellectual operation executed by Theodor Adorno and Marx Horkheimer when in Dialectic of Enlightenment, which was published towards the end of the Second World War, they put forward the controversial argument that fascism did not represent the aberration of the modern constitution, but rather its fulfillment. So in a central chapter of Dialectic of Enlightenment, the two philosophers um, focus on the Odyssey, and they basically present the Odyssey as a foundational humanist text that we are often made to read uh, as part of a classical education, as exemplary of the cultivation of a myopic cult of rationality in modernity. So basically read as a secularized epic centered on the ability of a patrician man, Ulysses, to overcome nature, magic, and superstition, the Odyssey epitomizes, um, or so Adorno and Orkheimer, Orkheimer argued in 1944, <coughs> the repressed problem of modern authoritarianism. Um, and much in the same way, um, I think in, tw in 2018, Darling looked at St. Jerome as a kind of prototype um, for the sovereign subject of modernity, particularly because this character had been taken up so much during the modern era, early modern era. Um, and by placing him at the foundation of the kind of world that we inhabit um, as modern subjects, particularly in, in Europe, um, we see a kind of vision of modernity starts to come through, which is not as a kind of apex of human progress, um, as the story is often still told, in spite of many decades of critique, but really as a kind of process of relentless colonization, subjection, and enslavement. Um, and so I start with these works from Darling's exhibition at Tate Britain, because for me, they epitomize, um, perhaps better than any other work, but I want to stress that this is something that runs through all of their work from, a, from an early um, point in their, in their career as an artist. They epitomize Darling's preoccupation with the violence of history as itself a modern discourse that is inherently tied up with hegemonic narratives, practices, and relationships. 
And so it is this set of ideas that I want to bring to our interpretation of No Ribbons, No Medals, um, an exhibition which I hope you've seen um, and whose titling stands from the outset as a critique of the triumphalism of history with its strong militaristic um, overtones. So as recounted by the artist, and this is kind of an amazing anecdote, um, the phrase no ribbons, no medals makes reference to a distant relative who, um, and here I'm roughly paraphrasing, darling, um, as a German prisoner of World War II, started fabricating hundreds of prosthetic um, limbs for his fellow um, <coughs> prisoners, for his injured comrades, um, using pieces of window frames, metal chairs, cotton batting, uh, rubber from old tires, um, essentially a whole range of um, camp scrap available um, around them. And so when the war then ended, um, he was sought out for recognition and decoration. However, he refused um, <clears throat> every attempt to basically give, them, uh, give him a medal, saying that he preferred to just forget what happened, to just forget this history entirely. Um, and I find this anecdote so powerful. I mean, it's an incredible story to <laughs> just found in your kind of family history, particularly because also the materials, and this is someone, something that the artist has remarked on, um, you know, the materials that this person was just using to create these prosthetic limbs were in a way comparable to the materials that Jesses uses uh, or their way in which they work using everyday <coughs> materials at hand, debris, uh, and things that can be put together through um, a kind of rough methods of construction. And of course, the whole, you know, um, kind of aesthetic of the, the prosthetic and the medical is something that comes through very strong in their work, as, as we'll see more uh, as I go through my slides. Um, and so um, to wrap it up on this point, I think we find a number of key themes and tropes that recur in the work of Darling in this anecdote. Um, on the one hand, the figure of the cripple as a casual, casualty of grand historical narratives rather than simply a casualty of a particular injury or trauma. Um, to uh, the idea that the past is not something to be glorified, but rather something that is best um, put to one side, um, um, critiqued. Uh, and also, um, I guess to some extent, the role of the artist as a kind of ingenious bricoler who is sifting, sifting through the debris of a weaponized world ruled by self-serving nationalisms. Um, and one might even turn to a very different series of work um, from an earlier period um, titled Domestic Terror, uh, in which we see similar themes of militarism, um, of uh, everydayness uh, kind of woven together with references that are much more clearly embedded in a kind of post 9-11 world, which is very much uh, a world that is inhabited by Darling's practice. And so, um, I would invite you to keep seeing these themes of violence, of warfare, uh, of domination through their work um, as, I, as I move um, across it in my presentation, but also obviously as you look at the show. Um, uh, because these are the themes that haven't really emerged sufficiently, I think, in relation to Jesse's work, because there's been such a huge focus on um, thinking of it in relation to sexual politics or the politics of identity, which is, are all important themes that are very much there. There is a kind of intersectional uh, critique going on in so much of the work, but each one of these themes in and of itself and in isolation really narrows down and reduces, I think, the ambition and the import of the work as a work that is really reflecting on the history of modernity, of the, on the history of um, a kind of Western project um, uh, which has very much led to the culture we inhabit today, particularly within a city like Oxford, of course, as a kind of bastion of um, uh, modern enlightened knowledge. Um, and so this critique of history for me is what the exhibition here at Modern Art Oxford really brings out in a way that has not been done before, partly because so much of the discourse around Darling's work has been inflected by biographical narratives um, that have foregrounded the register of identity politics over the artist's more substantial and more sub sustained, and I want to stress that this is something that was present in Darling's work from the outset, confrontation with the um, politics of modernity. And so I feel at this point, if I don't give a little bit of ba background, it won't really be very clear what I'm talking about. And I have up here 
a selfie to illustrate this kind of genealogy, but then um, I thought that maybe Jesse would be coming, so I, <laughs> so I took it out. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think that makes sense be because I'd rather not repeat the narrative visually, uh, but I'm gonna still recap it for you. So Darling um, first gained notoriety as one of the most eloquent exponents of a current since identified as post-internet art. Uh, a moniker that, um, importantly, they objected to from the start. So as early as 2014, um, Dali made a point of explaining that the temporal prefix in this fashionably avant-gardist label should not be understood as, quote, the successor to, but rather the crisis of, so the crisis of the internet rather than uh, the kind of aftermath of digital uh, technology. And so a clarification that from the outset, position their practice at odds with unabashed celebrations of the novelties of the digital or um, of sort of technological progress more broadly. And so then across a number of subsequent essays, Darling addressed the waning of 1990s um, net utopianism and the reconfiguration of online space for da data mining following the launch of Web 2.0 taking issue with the mystique held by this overwhelmingly corporate technology within the art world and beyond. So initially, uh, it is true that they too had hoped that the internet would provide an alternative to what they called meat space by supporting, quote, a mode of interaction that might mean I'd be able to see my piece without, um, I'd be able to say my piece without my tits getting in the way of this course. Um, and in keeping with this ambition, some of their earliest artworks um, center on selfies and gifts, uh, which basically explore notions of gender performativity. Uh, and these works, which I've, let's say, I have now consciously decided not to show you, um, played a key role in establishing these early narratives around Darling's work as one primarily concerned with issues of identity. Um, as early as 2015, however, the artist had already turned away from photography, seizing almost entirely to perform on camera and on stage, and that was a very deliberate decision. I remember at the time I invited them to do something for a conference, a program of performances that I was organizing, and I was just devastated that they were just like, no, I'm not going to do anything using my body anymore. And I was like, but you, only two weeks. And that was, yeah, the cut, cutting off point. And it was, you know, a, a very, um, had a lot of integrity, that decision, and, and pretty much they followed through, um, removing their work from uh, the kind of field of vision in a very um, strategic uh, and conscious way. And so instead, they took up sculpture, partly in a move to short circuit the biographical focus of so much discourse, discourse around their practice, but also in an effort to move beyond the body as a basis for critiquing heteronormative conceptions of the self. Um, so the relative eligibility of the object, they said, allowed me to hide in plain sight, um, or so they hoped. So sculptures like Material Girl, Girl um, here on the left, and Masquerade um, on the right, belong to this period of transition away from the, um, the selfie, let's say, um, made out of um, steel, cord, among other materials, uh, and importantly, recycled plastic bags emblazoned with the logos of low-budget supermarkets, a kind of recurring material for these artists. These assemblages configure an expendable body politic at the threshold of exhaustion between exhaustion and survival, capturing conditions of life lived precariously in the wake of a global market crash. And at this point, I think I want to just add a little bit um, and say that this, this practice was very much shaped by um, the fact that it came into being in a kind of post-2008 context, so in the aftermath of very much the financial crash um, that essentially shaped the last 15 years, but also very much in relationship to <coughs> the austerity agenda um, that um, has inflected um, the spaces that Darling um, and many others have uh, inhabited in, in this nation and internationally. And so um, this sense of crisis, um, one, at least one dimension of it, which is very grounded in a kind of recent history, uh, would have to be the sense of financial collapse and the kind of um, mass poverty uh, and mass vulnerability that resulted. Uh, but then, like everything with Darling's work, it's never really a question of pinning it down to a specific event um, or a, a narrow sort of chronological context of a set of policies, although I've written quite extensively about how this work relates to 
particularly the policies pursued by um, David Cameron in relation to disability and vulnerability and welfare in the last 14, well, during, uh, during his tenure as a prime minister. Um, but I really want to emphasize that in turning these histories into abstract bodies, into abstract sculptures, into symbols, um, then uh, something happens whereby um, these objects then ultimately becomes um, sort of portals for thinking about vulnerability on a much wider scale uh, and across a, you know, a much wider kind of historical trajectory. So in a way they're kind of taken out of the specific historical context um, and allow for uh, a kind of much more ambitious reading if you want. But I still, I think that context uh, is so essential to understanding how this artist was formed and also the kind of precarious spaces they inhabited as an artist who at the time was uh, operating primarily in London and what that meant on a very material level in terms of rents, in terms of support, in terms of, of living and making um, art. Uh, not to say that art, you know, uh, artists don't also occupy a, a, a hugely privileged um, place often within uh, society and that's something that uh, these are the contradictions that Darling has uh, of course been very aware of and has spoken uh, about at length. So um, shortly, I guess I suppose the next step after this work in 2017, we see these sort of signifiers of vulnerability or precarity, uh, which is so embedded on a material level um, in these sculptures, uh, um, not least because of how they sort of held together in ways that just feels, you know, particularly the one uh, with the wheels, it almost feels like you sort of can kind of um, run away or collapse any minute. There's this sort of uh, almost comic, tragic comic. Um, uh, precarity, so I think that the, 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 this is a kind of figurative piece. Um, uh, and the, these sort of metaphors become increasingly entrenched with a real, um, uh, I guess, a, a kind of direct reference to being ill uh, as such, as a you know, very specific uh, and very drastic form of vulnerability. Um, so in 2017, uh, Darling solo show at Chapter New York, titled, um, titled Support Levels, um, went further in this direction uh, by including mobility canes bent to resemble animate creatures, commode chairs crawling on the floor, and hygiene curtains with holes burned through them, with a the total effect of rendering the architectures of the care industrial complex as pressed, distressed, and in pain. So as infrastructural conditions decomposed under the pressure of austerity and privatization, the body politics too was imagined as falling apart, making vulnerability a potentially charged uh, political category. Uh, certainly in this sense, Judith Butler um, has written that vulnerability should not be seen as a subjective position, so a sort of individual uh, condition or liability, but rather a relationship shared across the field of objects, forces, subjects, and passions that impinge upon us. Um, and uh, furthermore, in this essay titled Rethinking Vulnerability and Resistance, Butler goes on to cite failing public infrastructures and raising, rising global precarity to argue that vulnerability is in fact the principal product of 21st century capitalism and so it becomes a kind of central way to think about what does it even mean to be political, what kind of futures are we seeking to imagine, what does the very idea of resistance mean uh, when vulnerability is something that affects populations on a mass scale. Um, we cannot talk about a body without knowing what supports that body and what its relation to that support or lack of support might be, um, Butler argued, um, essentially suggesting, well, sort of making a call for um, rethinking the meaning of resistance beyond what they call masculine models of autonomy, but essentially suggesting that the kind of traditional idea of taking to the street, of protesting in this very visible, very embodied, very physical, very, um, I guess, a sort of dynamic and... Um, also sort of exhausting ways might not be um, the, the, the way in which uh, this sort of uh, might not be a kind of a viable mode of political organization for the vast majorities of populations who um, want to sort of uh, put pressure against um, essentially um, a kind of neoliberal models of living. And so that, the, that it's necessary on a philosophical level, but also at the level of activist organization to think about what it might mean to design a kind of politics around vulnerability and to work from there and what that might allow. And I think there's a real sort of sense of hope 
in Butler's writing, for better or for worse, that this notion of vulnerability might also sort of create more inclusive alliances. That if you start, you know, that instead of sort of fragmented and a kind of resistance front between different identities, if you start thinking about something like vulnerability, exhaustion, debility, chronic illness, you might be able to sort of galvanize a kind of more collective um, body um, in order to start pressing for a kind of different world, which is, you know, as Darling themselves have put it, you know, complicated because um, I think there's a something they said at one point, you know, that this idea that the sick will rule the world, if you've ever been truly ill, you'll know that there won't be a lot of ruling going around. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a real shortcoming to this sort of um, philosophies, but they certainly have been very influential in the last five or six years, particularly in the art world, and I think they played a real role in shaping this phase in um, Darling's work too. Um, so, uh, in particular, was produced in the midst of uh, partial paralysis. So Darling um, was so ill at the time of producing the installation that they actually had to rely on the help of close collaborators uh, very extensively, though this was not explicitly foregrounded in the show. Rather, I'd say that personal experiences of extreme debility and dependency were translated into sculptural properties. So here, for example, um, this piece titled Plexus, um, for this piece, the artist tied a cool pack inside a back brace, which in turn was strapped onto the disabled grab bar install, installed onto the gallery wall. And so not only do these materials um, suggest injury and fragility because of their function, um, but the artist's strategic insistence on fastening and knotting, which is something that's very present throughout their work, for me really gives this sense of like something that is precarious, of this sense of sort of interdependency um, on a kind of poetic, metaphorical level. Um, and so, in a way, um, if Judy Butler, in a kind of theoretical, philosophical arena, insists that the concept of support is now crucial for thinking about a politics of resistance beyond historically masculine models of autonomy, um, for, for Jesse Darling, it's partly a question of changing the narrative of a medium sculpture that, his, that is historically associated with public displays of authority. And we've seen that especially in the kind of public statues and the, and the lions. Um, sculpt, sculpture has, particularly metal sculpture, uh, has very often sort of um, embodied this role. Um, and interestingly, on the point about metal, welding too with Darling loses all kind of uh, virile connotations. Um, so works like Collapsed Cane, which you can see here, made by adding an undulated aluminum bar between the handle and the rubber tip of a medical grade steel cane negate the proverbial hardness of these materials. Um, uh, Featurely subject in keeping with Darling's ambition to achieve what they call a non-macho sculpture practice. So there are so many levels to which these works are operating in terms of symbolism, in terms of the kind of techniques um, that Darling is using to assemble them, the sort of poetics that they um, evoke in the way they occupy space, in the way they relate to gravity, um, and the sort of political and philosophical connotations that go with all of that. Um, and yet, I think despite all these efforts to sort of remove themselves from, from the narrative and try to efface their body, um, particularly since they've um, suffered with um, this illness, I think this sort of focus on the biography has, has sort of creeped in again. And in relation to their show at Tate Britain, the tendency was very much to associate the lion as the sort of the injured party in the legend of Saint Jerome and the lion with Darling. And I had an image here um, that I also chose to remove, um, but which I, I feel um, comfortable discussing. Um, is, uh, there, there a, a series of shots have circulated of the artist in the studio in which the artist is essentially seen posing in a similar kind of crouching position to the lion, and they also have a blonde mullet. So there's a real effort. They feel quite staged, those images, but I don't know if they were, but there was a real effort to sort of identify this figure of the lion with the artist and kind of bring back the personal history of the artist into the show, which I think for me 
what it does, it sort of reduces this conversation around debility, vulnerability to, again, a kind of individual story. You know, this artist had this accident which led to this diagnosis and the reality of them uh, making work and struggling with partial paralysis rather than this work is trying to kind of think about illness as something that is structural, as something that is shared on a mass scale, as vulnerability, stress, fatigue, exhaustion, um, debility, as something that um, is really affecting entire populations, and particularly marginalised populations, um, and not, not least queer populations. And so what does that mean in terms of thinking about a politics around that. Um, so that's where the kind of autobiographical narrative really kind of blunts the political edge, I think, of Darling's work. <coughs> Whereas actually, um, I think in a kind of co conscious of this, these potential um, drawbacks, uh, in an interview given around the time of the Tate show, they, um, the artist said, I was forced in a way because of what I was going through to think about chronic illness, chronic dysphoria, um, chronic unbelonging as a form of resistance, which is very much the kind of idea that Butler also has, that these are positions from which one can mount a kind of uh, pushback. Um, and so I think statements such as this one really give an, an indication of their desire to use art to turn personal experiences of debility into a form of social critique. Um, and significantly on this point, Darling's use of medical paraphernalia, it turns out, predates by far um, there are neurological symptoms um, which um, came on as a result of um, giving birth in, I think, 2017. Uh, so as early as 2015, in a show with Takeshi Shomitsu titled Spirit Level in London, the artist had presented a series of precariously balanced assemblages whose internal components had been fastened together by um, with using tourniquet bands, which... I know I can't pronounce, uh, the, but I hardly know what I mean. And also I don't have an image because it's been removed uh, from the internet. Um, and so I couldn't bring it, but I have this image of Prince's horse, uh, Tyrell's horse, another piece from 2015, um, which similarly is a kind of valiantly shabby reinterpretation of a hobby horse propped up by a crutch and an empty beer can. So already in 2015, crutches were very much there as a kind of favored material. Um, and this is, ag again, another piece that is willfully anti-monumental and which belongs with Darling's repeated parodies of equestrian statues. Um, and so this is, again, this sort of universe of um, sculptures of um, horses. It kind of comes in, again, as a kind of another materialization of um, a sort of another critique of the kind of hegemonic cultures that have shaped um, the history of sculpture and also the physical and ideological spaces we move through as modern subjects, given that a question such as are often displayed in public. Um, and so by drawing attention to the ubiquity of these statues, darling sculptures once again demonstrate the extent to which symbolic structures of signification have contributed to maintaining a social order over time based on ableist values of endurance, fitness, and domination, which horses and lions very much represent. Um, and so in my more extensive research on Darling, I've um, discussed works like Princess Horse in terms of what I've called crit aesthetics, um, approaching it through the lens of the work of Robert McCruer's, um, an amazing um, theorist um, who has kind of been thinking about works primarily by um, uh, um, primarily by disabled artists um, who appear to offer kind of bottom-up critique of his the history of the monument by undercutting its traditional forms of authority, whilst also amplifying the discord that characterizes for McRoy what he calls crip times. So for McCrory, crip times on a kind of very basic level means austerity as a moment of aggravated social vulnerability. Uh, what's interesting to me is that in his writing, the word crip uh, is not just a stand-in for an identity, it's not just an individual, um, but more a kind of historical predicament. So you have, you know, crip times rather than crip selves. Um, and crip times, it sort of signifies the aftermath of the financial crash of 20, 2008, um, but also a, a kind of a, a whole history of modernity that sort of led to... Um, the kind of um, ableist um, 
regimes uh, that we live with today, the sort of like focus on competition, a really kind of neoliberal ideology that has emerged out of um, historic forms of capitalism. Um, at the same time, for McCrewe, um, ever so hopeful, Crip, Crip Times also s identifies a kind of practice of resistance. So his writings are really focused on work by artists that really push back, uh, particularly against cuts, uh, welfare cuts during um, uh, the last 20 years, and which otherwise sort of you produce work that really has a kind of activist function. Um, and which uh, it's, it's complicated. I'm not going to go into this now, but I think this this the Darling's work has a complicated relationship to activism um, and what can what uh, what's the difference between the space outside the museum and within the museum, which we may want to discuss in the Q and A. Um, but I think what I want to stick with today is um, on the one hand, I think this idea of a kind of resistance, a de debilitated resistance, is a very present in Darling's work, as I've now argued <laughs> over and over again. But I think this poster, perhaps more than any other work, because it's so literal and obviously has text, is kind of shouting it out loud. Um, and I think it makes a similar point to McGrew, is this idea that debility or disability is also a point, a kind of a privileged position from which to resist um, the kind of extreme um, alienation and um, kind of um, violence of, the, of, the, of um, capitalism. And so, it, which is a sort of unwitting, the whole point is this, this is a kind of unwitting argument that the expectation historically has been that particularly disabled people cannot occupy a place in the front line of resistance. Uh, because resistance has so often been theorized and imagined as something that requires a neighbor body in order to be performed. Um, and so McCrewer and others, uh, as many activists have done historically, are kind of very much turning that notion on their heads. Um, what's also interesting about his work to me um, is that, well, first of all, he's kind of thinking about the, the ability in a sort of expansive sense. And so, for example, he speaks about coalitions of left behinds who may or may not identify as disabled, but who can be comprehended as com connected expansively. And I think that really resonates with this uh, phrase, with this idea that Darling has often used of a kind of loser militia. Um, so a kind of uh, coalition of, um, you know, losers in, in Darling's own terminology, which becomes a kind of um, just as powerful as it is uh, um, marginal, just as militant as it is marginal. And so it's it reimagined as this kind of militia uh, propelled by asthma inhalers <laughs> and the like. And it's a really strong image that has uh, it started off as a kind of a hashtag that Darling used in the early years of their practice and has run through a lot of their work over time. And I think still every time I step in one of their exhibitions, I still immediately think, oh, the loser militia is sort of like um, um, taking up space. Uh, and and it's still, it really sticks with me as a really good framework for their work. Um, but also, again, uh, with this idea of um, uh, crypt time, uh, McRoy sort of takes it further and really starts to think about uh, the experience of debility and disability as a kind of, not just again as a kind of embodied experience, an individual condition, but really a way of knowing the world, a way of thinking, a kind of a methodology and an analytic. And I think this again um, really resonates with Darling's work, which kind of reimagines the whole history of uh, Western so-called civilization through the perspective of the ability. And I think no work more than this titled um, Epistemology's Shamed Cabinet really kind of illustrates this idea of um, a kind of injury that becomes uh, not only a badge of honor, but also a whole way of reimagining history as we know it. So um, this is basically an old display case uh, filled with archival binders. This is how they're described in the label. Um, whose metal legs have been bent dramatically out of shape. Uh, and for me, the sculpture really performs this idea of cripping the archive of Western knowledge. More than any other work by Darling, it can be seen as capturing the spirit of what McCrewe calls creepistemology as a counter-hegemonic discipline guided by, in the words of Jack Halberstam's, modes of not knowing, unknowing, and failing to know. 
Uh, and these values could not be further from the techno-positivist orthodoxies that continue to steer the world into what has already proven to be a catastrophic century, not just for human populations, but in environmental terms too. So for me, there's something incredibly progressive about this sort of giving up the um, attempt to sort of control and know and shape reality through scientific methods and to kind of embrace an epistemology that's founded around notions of failure um, and unknowing. And a kind of, uh, there's a sort of humbleness in that too. Uh, and the question is, you know, what kind of different um, reality can be constructed by approaching reality through that principle. And so fallibility is certainly key to Darling's aesthetic, and one finds it in the repeated portrayals of Icarus, uh, whose fatal flight stands as a warning against human hubris, particularly with regards to science and technology. But in many other works and aspects of their work, um, one finds it also, for example, in their um, repeated reinterpretations of Batman, uh, which Darling has time and again transformed into a kind of fallen hero, um, and so the prototype for a man enhanced by electronic hardware and a rigorous fitness routine, the original Batman character, of course, encapsulates distinctively patrician fantasies of self-weaponization as a sort of another kind of Ulysses. And in stark contrast, uh, a work like this one, titled Our Lady Batman of the Empty Center, portrays the Kate superhero as a kind of hemorrhaging beggar complete with a gaping wound in the middle of its tinfoil torso, band-aid wrappers, ECG stickers, cemetery flowers, and an empty, and an empty paper cup in hand. And um, I could spend more time, but I won't, on um, the kind of aesthetics of wounds and holes and perforated spaces that really runs through Jesse's work and which, again, for me, very much, you know, they represent wounds, but they also, and they represent a kind of wounded world with all the sort of political and ecological connotations that might have. Uh, but they also very much kind of, for me, suggest a kind of way of knowing what might it mean if we kind of modeled our ideals, uh, even of masculinity, around a kind of wounded Batman rather than the original. I mean, although arguably the original character is also pretty wounded, and I think that's why also this works very well. Um, and, but for me, also, this work really has echoes of Baudelaire. Every time I think about Darling's work, I always go back to Baudelaire because it has this sort of like, you know, critique of everything. And it, in the same way that Baudelaire performed this role uh, at the kind of onset of industrialization, of sort of uh, imagining, kind of romanticizing the debris of industrial modernity, of sort of, you know, uh, kind of siding with and celebrating the marginal, the wounded, and creating this sort of really, um, uh, fantastic and, and powerful sort of vision of a, a kind of socially impoverished world where they still have so much beauty and so much hope for a kind of different reality. And so for me, these works um, do something similar. Um, and I think all these, you know, wilted flowers, sphinxes, um, kind of fallen heroes, uh, paupers, uh, beggars, these are all kind of very much part of a Baudelairean conception of reality. And this is where kind of for me, once again, to reiterate to really have Darling as an artist who is measuring themselves with these grand historical figures who, who really thought about history and the kind of major transformations in, um, in uh, history, in kind of modes of production, in social relations. So it's not really an artist who's just concerned with, you know, the kind of identity politics, particularly as they kind of, as a, of course, nonetheless, totally integral to these conversations. Um, and so that's my point uh, about Baudelaire. I'm kind of drawing to a close here, um, uh, but I want to just spend a little bit more thinking about, um, I'm just gonna stay with this kind of Darling's choice of materials because I've been mean, really remarked on that and it's such an important part of their practice. And really that's also where this idea of fallibility and vulnerability comes through. Uh, of course there's plasters, bandages, and medical supplies which have very direct uh, kind of symbolic um, connotation, uh, they speak of sort of patched up hurt subjects, but also things like basic packing paper, expanding foam, um, give their assemblages a sort of provisional DIY air, and at the same time building components like steel rods and jasmonites conjure up a body politics beset by the effects of real estate speculation and gentrification, phenomena whose artists the artists explicitly um, confronted and experienced firsthand before they finally decided to leave London for the more affordable Berlin. 
Uh, and one might say, and I'm not the first to suggest this, that Darling's artwork has cultural equivalents of what Hito Styrel has called the poor image. So for Styrel, uh, the poor image is sort of the debris of audiovisual production, which might include pixelated videos, stream with a poor internet connection, or degraded image files, whose format has been made obsolete by later advances in the field of digital imaging. So uh, to me, you know, this is essentially the kind of poor sculptures, uh, like the poor image, the poor sculpture speaks for the victims of the digital age and of history more broadly and of technological progress more broadly, rather than its champions. And in a way, darling downgraded Batman um, to the former category. Going on, cheap plastic implements and other polymer-based commodities replicate the materiality of a throwaway economy that has already compromised our planet beyond repair. I find myself drawn ambivalently to petrochemical materials, Darling has recently admitted, before adding, plastic in particular is a kind of zombie medium, bright, lurid, doesn't really decay, and it's made from fossil fuels, which in a certain sense can be, as, can be seen as the exhumation of the ancestors. Steel um, is the technology of coloniality and capitalism, industry, war. So there's this whole, again, kind of history of the world embedded in these materials. Um, and to the list of sort of uh, uh, these kind of petrochemical materials that the artist seems to favor, one could also add aluminum, which is a prime military and medical technology uh, that Mimi Scheller, among others, an amazing book just called Aluminium, MIT, highly recommended, just so brilliant, um, has sort of shown to be totally integral to 20th century experiences of speed, connectivity, or mobility. Uh, actually, Benito Mussolini's brother was a massive fan of aluminium, wrote a lot about it. So it's just, you know, that aluminium should be the invention without which flying would not be possible is only fitting when one considers Darling's repeated use of this material to make artworks that reference wings and airplanes and this installation um, with 600 paper plane, well, aluminum, uh, sorry, paper plane uh, kind of um, falling on the floor uh, speaks powerfully. It's a sort of exemplary of this whole uh, strand, thematic strand in their work. Um, and it speaks very powerfully of ideas around travel exhaustion, uh, which Darling has spoken about, in particularly in relation to what an artist is, kind of is expected to do, but also, I think, more broadly in relation to what globalization means and what globalized lives can mean, uh, both on the side of being overspent, over-traveled, but also uh, in relation to how mobility is blocked and uh, opened up on very differential uh, axis. Uh, and so we have very of course, uneven access to mobility. And I think that, you know, Icarus is sort of explore further how it ties up with um, Darling's other work. You know, Icarus is sort of fallen figures that can't take off. There's all this signifies around freedom, uh, a sort of impossibility, which again speaks to this sort of big histories of like the social contract, the modern subject, but also more recent political history, um, thinking about works that reference 9-11, uh, thinking about works that reference migration, airports, um, and uh, paralysis and mobility, both experienced individually, medically, but also politically. So all of these themes, I think, are very rich and kind of woven through uh, these repeated references to planes and, and fallen winged figures, or figures whose winged have, have been clipped. Um, and so with this sort of final kind of critique of... Um, progress, I guess, with these kind of images of a sort of frustrated ascent, I kind of want to just end. Um, these are two works that I uh, wanted to show in relation, I suppose, to this last point, these kind of landers that go nowhere for me, just so interesting, and I'd love to hear more from the audience. Um, it's not something I really thought much about, uh, but I just find this whole kind of narrative really interesting. Um, and moving on, I just want to end with this kind of final remarks on the I suppose, ecological connotation of all of this work. Because, of course, the vision of a kind of terminally injured biosphere is this sort of inevitable corollary to a lot of this work, and particularly to this use of petrochemical materials. Um, and so I want to end this talk with this cluster of arboreal forms that Darling made for the Ballad of St. Jerome at Tay Britain, using plastic tubes, upside-down crutches, and toilet brushes again. Um, conceived as a kind of stand-in for the toxic economy of petroleum modernity, that's how the artist described it. 
the synthetic forest um, really add a manifestly ecological dimension to Darling's, pra Darling's practice and their critique of um, modernity. Behind it, uh, behind it, providing the focal point for the installation was a gaping hole, which the artist compared to a wound, again, and an altarpiece for a society permanently in awe of its own self-destruction. And so making an abashed use of metaphor, Darling has espoused uh, an almost metaphysical, almost um, ultimately approach to chronic illness. Uh, and it's also in this sense that I kind of titled this talk, History is What Evasive crisis, financial, ecological, political, social, relational. Um, and ultimately, for me, it is this sense of overriding emergency that this artist captures by assembling their work around material sig signifiers of stability. And so with this, um, I'm conscious that I went on for too long, so I'm just going to wrap it up here. And thank you for listening for ages. <laughs> and uh, I did a little bit off the cuff because I didn't want it to be too formal, and so I'm sorry if I repeated myself. Uh, but again, thanks for listening. Um, thank you so much. That was perfect, I think. It kind of really... Um, it really reflected. Light. <laughs> <laughs> I was. It actually really reflected a lot the thinking that Jesse and I went through when selecting the works, and it was like you were like a fly on the wall on many conversations about pieces and the, the selection of works and what Jesse certainly understands that they're doing, and what I have found, even in I mean, particularly around the aspects of the military, especially in the last few weeks, like how those become so much more resonant within the exhibition, given the materials and certain motifs in the show. I've got a bunch of comments and questions, and I, I can, I can just there's things to really add. Um, I was really, I think the your making a, a point about not returning to the biography of the artist is very important with Jesse's work and for this exhibition. Maybe I just wanted to foreground that as a curatorial approach. We've been very careful in just trying to avoid certain characterizations of the work which have been very prevalent within art press to kind of really use this as an opportunity to create a new narrative, much as Julia's really thoroughly outlined around this work. And to really, even with Tyrrell's horse, highlighting that the use of the crutch is something that predates certain kind of moments in their practice. Um, and I just thought that was really important to say that it's quite challenging to, when you're working with a contemporary artist, to really kind of set new terms around the work, and particularly with an artist such as Jesse, which is a very entrenched way of talking about them in particular and the work that they've made. So um, it's really refreshing to kind of get that in-depth history there. Um, that was one point I wanted to make. Another was really about um, the use of plastic bags, and you describe them as austerity works, which is very much what... Jesse would describe them. There's a piece in the show called The Deputation and various allusions to plastic carrier bags. And actually, this is just an aside, but um, some of those pieces have been remade uh, for the exhibition. A lot of the works are very fragile and precarious. Some of them no longer exist. Some have been made, especially for this exhibition. But in terms of ecology, bags for life mean that we can't really make those works anymore either. So there's an interesting um, crystallization of time within certain pieces because they do come out of austerity politics or thinking about the bedroom tax and material culture at the time. So it's interesting to survey the last 10 years and think how much has happened and also how much material culture has continued to change over that period. Um, maybe one, th one thing I wanted to ask actually was um, you also pointed out that there are no of the early digital works, and that was very intentional. This is an exhibition that focuses on sculpture and drawing and photography, and Jesse and I m wanted to kind of, yeah, reframe, but also intentionally exclude a body of work, which they became very well known for um, in the early 2010s. So that isn't in the exhibition, but thinking about the selfie and how they've used the selfie a lot. Um, there's a lot of self-portraits, I think, in the show as well. A lot of these works are... A, a, an approach towards an idea of a self-portrait through sculpture. So that's something maybe um, I just wanted to point out. Um, <laughs> and I've got lots of other questions. I mean, one thing we could start is your point about activism, which is a really good point, and where the activism might be located within this work. Some, I've got a written down a phrase which, when we're writing about the show, you know, just really talking to Jesse and looking back at what's been, how they've talked about their work. And one phrase is they see the work as being a call to arms and a call for hope. And that was something that they've previously characterized their work about. And that isn't necessarily a form of activism, but there's certainly an, uh, the provocation to an audience to come together 
and maybe they're not they're not practicing activism the way that some artists might identify as political practice, but there is certainly um, an incentive to kind of pull together a community and to kind of, yeah, as a call to arms within these works, would you say? Or I think that I, you know, I really hate the narrative that art has to be useful because it's so um, abused, particularly by funders and um, sort of government-led funding schemes uh, that trickle down into the agenda of institutions. And one of the reasons why I was interested in this work um, compared to other work by artists who are working in a field of um, disability politics or queer aesthetics is because it's really about kind of allegories, storytelling, symbolism, and to me, it is not trying to do other things. And I really appreciate that. And I, and I feel really there's a real impoverishment in kind of debates where that is no longer, um, that doesn't feel like it has enough of a place because everything has to be geared towards a kind of very clear, re historically recognized form of activism or like particularly a kind of usefulness where you can sort of really see, okay, well, this is the work and these are the effects. And I, that's how I'm measuring the success of the work. So. I am, um, you know, I think there's a lot of nuance in where the political is within an art practice. And so I, I feel, you know, there are many, they are very open to some of these statements. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the work functions as a call to arms. To be honest, I think I'm also a little bit too <coughs> involved with it. I also met, uh, I don't know if I did meet this, but I certainly saw their work first at the time where um, we were both involved with a number of um, um, spaces in London that were kind of fighting some extent against the gentrification of Tottenham, uh, a largely, uh, well, a kind of mixed area in North London. Uh, there was a, a lot in the way that people lived and how they understood their politics that was formed around a kind of uh, an idea of militants. And the, the places where Jesse showed some of the earlier work were part of this, you know, kind of political. So it's not like they um, have always operated within recognized museums that kind of occupy a different place from um, uh, a militant kind of field uh, embedded within this, the city. Um, I think a lot of, it, so th I think there's just a lot more to say, but I also don't want to speak for them and, I, and, not, and nor do I want to speak for the audience. I think I, I don't know. I think it's an interesting question for everyone where they see the politics in the work. And I think sometimes some of these statements do feel um, overtly kind of utopian, but we also do need utopias. I just sometimes um, the way they then get kind of um, mixed in with the agendas of museums, that this, this it's, it's difficult to make kind of politically pure work that works for an art world as well. Say. Yeah, and I would also say that um, something I was thinking about when you were talking is the uh, representation, well, the representation in the work and the fact that it's not wholly representative at all. Jesse really relies on like a very evocative language, really. Everything is suggestive rather than fully detailed or shown. And I kind of think that is interesting to think about the, the politics of this work where it is so poetic and so, yeah, Baudelarian, like open to interpretation and has a real... Um, like, yeah, very tragic beauty within it, I think, and lots of people have been responding to that. Um, I think something I, Jess, about the St. Jerome show in particular, um, Jesse would say that people thought it was very depressing. Maybe this works about mortality and death. A lot of it is alluding to the finite quality of materials and of our bodies and of lives and the inherent sense of failure, but there is a, a hopefulness in the work. This is a sense of resilience. The, the collapsed canes do kind of I was, you know, like, like this brazen snake here, it's continuing to exist, it's kind of continuing to survive and it's adapting and changing. I think for that is, that's maybe the, the incentive there is to kind of find hope within these kind of incredibly oppressive conditions that they're trying to evoke. I think also for me, um, and I, this may, I don't know what Jesse would say, the ability has always been very, I found a lot of breathing space in there in a way that I wasn't finding in relation particularly to uh, kind of um, Marxist narratives and um, around what political action should look like on a very, very much kind of on the ground so in relation to the, the aftermath of the financial crisis, um, uh, the war in Iraq, the sort of uh, the raising of the fee of university fees, there was just a lot of mobilization, a lot of creation, as there is for every generation, I suppose that's kind of just my generation. 
And I often felt like I was in this conversation with like um, older, really disenchanted, sort of super Marxist men who really didn't tolerate, like they had such a kind of narrow idea of what is political, what isn't. And I think this is also some of the critique that this work has received, particularly by people like Nina Power. Um, and it just felt very oppressive. And for me, th there's definitely a lot of, uh, you know, I, I really am also invested in those politics and certainly like in Marx's reading of mo modernity. But I, there is a lot of breathing space, so I do, uh, I do connect to this idea of hope and, but I, I'm always very skeptical of going with very grand narratives, so I, I don't know if I can answer any of these questions. No, so no, this I think really that's fine. Does anyone have any comments or things to share at all? Perfect. Um, I have a question. Um, so, um, <coughs> sorry, I just wanted to draw on something that I noticed when going around that exhibition. Um, in relation to what you said about like the celebration of like the marginalised and the romanticisation of disability, um, like quite Baudelarian sense, um, and the sense that I got from the exhibition actually is that um, Darling sort of creates idols, um, like maybe of disability, so like the scepter of Jerome um, and like all of that sort of stuff. So I was wondering what you thought about that um, in their work. I think that's very difficult. I think it's a really good question. The article that I wrote compares their work to that of Carolyn Lazard, who is an American artist, who is, um, I'd say, quite sceptical of Darling's work on those grounds. And I think, so I wanted to kind of let that debate play out, which I think is a useful, so I kind of would like to I'd redirect you know, towards reading that in a way. Uh, I think it's useful because it, it, you have to consider that aspect, and particularly when the work you know, it's then shown in um, a kind of within a pretty successful art and, you know, uh, occupies a pretty visible space in a kind of art, in art industry, in a, in a major museum. The work is sold. I mean, there has this whole, like, you know, li and, and icons, you know, work better than a lot of, um, there's a lot of work, the kind of works that Mekrura looks at in terms of art by disabled artists who are also activists is so much less palatable to the mainstream art market. And this is always a conversation that plays out in this kind of situation. And so it's there, uh, it's a limitation to the politics of the work, for sure. At the same time, I think, you know, I want to have a very expansive and rich definition of what can be the political and what, how can we imagine it. And I think storytelling also plays a big part in that. And that's where, you know, I, I don't want to reduce a kind of politics of an artwork to a kind of utilitarian framework, because I think in the suggestiveness, in the, um, in this, you know, so in a way, it was very unfair of me to put, make that comparison in that article, which um, because it really doesn't necessarily cast a very positive light on just this work. I mean, it's almost like set up to fail because the politics are so much uh, so different, um, and I feel it doesn't totally do it justice. And I think that. Um, I'm sure that a lot of our, particularly of a kind of older generation, a lot of um, people who live with disabilities or art, disabled artists would find the work very, very difficult because of that. Um, I would, add, I would um, just add to that this, uh, in terms of creating the, the creation of idols, something they often talk about is about the lesser saints. So they've kind of, they have a lot of hagiography in their work and thinking about the the lineage of sainthood, though, and they mentioned recently, people are still being sainted. You know, Harvey Milk is a saint, there's lots of other saints that are anointed, and they're t maybe trying to, like no medals, no ribbons, trying to conjure uh, a kind of uh, counter saint, maybe. So that I think, but you, I think you're right, there's some imaging there through like decrepit materials of a, of a version of an idol, but maybe one that maybe you wouldn't consider to be such. Perhaps. But I think also the, the, well, the repressed sort of narrative in my talk is definitely religion and the church mm. because yeah. that's, you know, it's a huge part of us, what modernity as a kind of Western project, obviously Christianity. And it's so uh, pervasive in Oxford where Jesse mm. grew up, I mean, the whole college system. And it's totally everywhere in their work. And it's, I, I think it just needs someone who has interesting ideas about that to write about it, which is definitely not me. I mean, I grew <laughs> up in Rome, went to like <laughs> too many churches in my life, I have zero interest in yeah. thinking about that. But um, I think Darling at one point said something along the lines of, I kind of want to deconstruct modernity as a form of syncretic religion. Mm. Uh, so as a kind of, you know, 
Um, so very much playing with this idea of uh, idolatry and a kind of blind faith into certain, in some ideas like, like progress, uh, mm. for example. So that's all there, a great piece of writing waiting to happen. I think you pointed out it's very hard to talk about one aspect of the work as well because it is it is modernity and it is you've done a great job of synthesizing a lot of very complex ideas and histories and narratives that are so eloquently really uh, distilled in particular works. Um, if there's anything else, okay, cool. Um, thank you for your talk. There was much there. Uh, I wanted to maybe pick up on your suggestion that we speak a little bit about the museum and the way that this work functions in the space of the museum. Um, and I was trying to kind of puzzle through uh, what you were speaking about with this kind of ambiguity that Butler also brings up between sort of the vitrines that are kind of falling over into the corners of the museum and are themselves sort of display architecture. Um, for me, it was very ambiguous if they were slumping over because they, um, were kind of protesting being made or protesting appearing in the space of the museum or if they just couldn't stand, you know, if it was sort of a, an act of resistance or if it was an act of stability. Um, and I was wondering kind of in that ambiguity, what role does that cast the gallery in or the museum in? And I mean, again, maybe just to mention like the museum is like the kind of emblem of modernity in many ways. It's very much the product of the modern age. Um, and this work, which is very much a critique of certain ideas of modernity is appearing within that architecture. So I was wondering sort of where you saw the, the space of the museum is figuring into that. I think you've already done an amazing <laughs> job. On. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big part of the work, I think especially of that work of Tate Britain. Um, that's, you know, as Amy said, it's very difficult to isolate one strand church, museum, science, the medical profession, um, they're all sort of, you know, this is a kind of Foucauldian taking apart of the whole modern project of, of, of you know, a kind of what makes the fabric of our institutions. And I think that the use of plexiglass cabinets works at the same time to create kind of, again, something that sort of prevents, that kind of stifles the work, that it has to, you know, has this sort of sense of uh, kind of something that is, I think what at one point they spoke about, you know, a kind of butterfly in a natural history museum, something that could have flown but never has. And so there's this sense of a kind of freedom that is being, you know, something that's been specific. They have this kind of deadening effect and they are, specific references to museum practices and you know not just the kind of modern art museum or the national collection but the natural science natural history museum and those kind of genealogies and and then yes especially in the so there are lots of formal strategies that are deployed very consciously in order to um critique the museum um i think it's just complicated because um the, Darling is a very ambitious artist who wants to have a presence in museums um, and they certainly want to be seen. I think ultimately there's a kind of mastery at play even in the like relationship with failure and, uh, and wanting to be recognised and then why shouldn't they? Um, and at the same time there's a real um, sense of discomfort with b being in a museum and uh, placing the work in there and participating in this history and so the work does a lot to um, address that. And I think you picked up on a lot of those aspects. I feel this is a call for me that's coming no, from that's upstairs, okay. this <laughs> a little shouting creature. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much, Julia. That was really <laughs> wonderful. And thank you for coming. And do go see the exhibition. It's on until the 1st of May, if you haven't. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.